वेलकम टू दिस क्लास ऑन न्यू सेंस ऑफ ह्यूमन मोमेंट सप्टेलोमोटोमी वाज द अप्रोच टू ट्रीट पार्किंसन्स डिसीज सो एसेंशियली व्हाट हैपेंस इज दैट द सप्टेलोमिक न्यूक्लियस इज रिमूव्ड राइट दिस लीड्स टू रिडक्शन इन इनहिबिशन दस लीडिंग टू एन इम्प्रूवमेंट इन द मोटर फंक्शन राइट सो एलडोपा लोडोपा इज एसेंशियली L34 थ्री फोर डई हईड्राक्सी फेनिल अनिल रईट सो इट इस ए प्री कर्सर टू डोपम सो रिमूवल आफ कॉर्बाक्सल ग्रूप फ्रम दिस आक्चुअली लीड्स टू द अमीन दट इस डोपम सो वाट हेपन इज दट वेन दिस इज टेकन दिस इंप्रूव दि अमौंट आफ डोपम इन द बेसल गैंग्लिया सो इंपारटेंटली हियर you are not treating the disease you are not treating the pathology you are treating the symptom so this is used for symptomatic treatment of parkinson's disease so essentially you are managing the symptoms you are not treating the pathology the pathology is degeneration of neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta it is not like taking levodopa is actually going to cause a uh, regeneration of these neurons in some sense right that's not going to happen so essentially also it does not even pause or stop neurodegeneration ldopa does not pass uh, neurodegeneration right unfortunately early on in the disease uh, this gives very good results and very satisfied satisfactory results right but uh, later on in advanced stages the response of the patient to ldopa is less and less so as the patient's pathology progresses the ability of the patient to respond to ldopa reduces right so early on the patient responds well but as the pathology progresses the patient is no longer able to respond well okay so ldopa comes with its own side effects immediately after uh, ldopa intake there is uh, hypotension there is nausea so lack of sleep hallucination also when the dose uh, ends or when the time of uh, the dosage ends like it might be 12 hours in early cases and it might be lesser in later stages of the disease what happens is there is a deterioration of motor function so essentially the motor function that was restored due to levodopa is now going back to its original state so which means that you have to take the next uh, uh, dose of the medication so this leads to a situation where the patient continues to depend on the medication for the uh, motor function but um, once again let us remember you are only managing the symptom you are only treating the symptom not the disease not the pathology right the long term effect is that you know a resistance kind of uh, situation wherein uh, the same dosage only produces a lesser positive effect so early on the patient was able to manage with the medication for about 12 hours later on the patient can only manage for much lesser so some sort of resistance like situation builds up then levodopa induced dyskinesia develop so it's a very unusual and very difficult problem right so what is called as levodopa induced dyskinesia right or in short lid so uh, this is a situation in which the patient if he takes the levodopa then he is going to have dyskinesia or unwanted movements if he doesn't take uh, the medication then he has uh, no movements whatsoever now he has to choose between uh, whether to have the medication and suffer its side effects or whether to not have the medication or suffer the pathology so it's it, there is no choice really one kind of suffering will continue so this is an unfortunate situation that happens 
in the long term with the intake of levodopa right. Also what happens is there is an amount of dysregulation uh, of dopamine. So, essentially a resistance kind of situation develops later on right, may be due to multiple factors, may be due to the role of receptors or may be due to other factors. Right? Uh, one alternative that has been suggested is deep brain stimulation. What this does is this implants pacemaker like devices deep inside the brain specifically in the subthalamic nucleus for example and uh, so surgical implantation. So, these electrodes are embedded surgically deep inside the brain in the subthalamic nucleus and like you are activating a pacemaker this uh, system is activated using say a battery right. Now, this is known to improve motor function in uh, patients right. Um, actually how exactly does this work? Now, that is not understood which is why this approach is in general considered a very controversial approach. By the way not every patient can take this that is one the physician only can make the decision on whether a patient is a suitable candidate for this. Uh, not just that since we do not understand how this works or why this works right uh, because of that reason because we do not understand how or why uh, deep brain stimulation works it is not clear. Uh, which particular cases will result in what kind of uh, improvements. So, that is continuing to be a case of trial and error type of uh, uh, improvement. A lot of information is now available still there is not a clear understanding of how or why deep brain stimulation works right. Several mechanisms have been proposed and speculated and one is that there is pack or uh, pulse amplitude coupling in the brain between different regions. Now, deep brain stimulation essentially decouples this uh, alpha and beta frequency waves in basal ganglia uh, inhibiting the gamma activity in the cortex thus uh, reducing the abnormal activity in the cortex and improving the possibility that the cortex can actually work in a more normal fashion. Now, that is probably uh, the reason why deep brain stimulation uh, is effective. These are just hypotheses we actually do not know how or why deep brain stimulation works and why some patients uh, respond better to deep brain stimulation than others right. In general this is considered better than L dopa and in general um, patients for whom L dopa fails to function right are uh, probable candidates for uh, DBS. Of course, there are multiple uh, reasons, uh, there are multiple factors that are considered uh, before making a decision on that. Of course, cost is a consideration, it is a very expensive procedure, it is a surgical procedure. So, the moment you say surgery, the cost associated with the surgery come into the picture. So, it is a more expensive procedure and it is a controversial procedure because we do not understand what is uh, causing this uh, positive effect right. And also uh, it turns out that uh, a particular frequency right if it does not work right, then the patient will have to go back to the doctor and the doctor will reset the, the frequency of uh, the stimulation to something else that will actually work. Now at that point it is not clear why the previous frequency did not work and the current frequency is now working. It is also not clear why the current frequency did not work earlier in the first attempt and why is it working now. A uh, lot of confusion so which is why this uh, procedure remains controversial. People are uh, trying to understand the physiology behind this, the exact pathophysiology and the improvement due to this uh, continues to be elusive for uh, us. So, here is a x-ray picture showing uh, the electrodes uh, the probe course in projection uh, on an x-ray this is a frontal view. 
so so, so there you see the implant so that the, so that's the electrode right? that's where you see uh, in the lateral view so that's where you see right bilaterally on uh, both subthalamic nuclei right well the other approach is also controversial. Uh, we know that uh, the neurons in the substantial negra pass compact are degenerate or die and so they cannot produce dopamine. Right? Suppose you can implant these stem cells in the particular region and they can now produce uh, dopamine. Then this uh, dopamine or uh, these dopaminergic neurons then communicate information they, then it transmits signals. Then you essentially have a situation that is very similar to the natural system. Of course, uh, many of these steps have to be crossed to reach that point. Uh, what are these steps? Essentially replace the damaged cell in the dopaminergic uh, area with new cells. Let us remember that it may or may not halt uh, neurodegeneration, most likely it, it is not going to halt uh, neurodegeneration. Uh, an oversimplified version of the method is you have to extract uh, the stem cell right, and allow it to expand in number and differentiate them into particular type into the dopaminergic type and then implant them in the beach. Looks super simple right, but uh, very difficult to cross all these steps and uh, this particular uh, this technology is not yet ready for use in humans. Very again. Also other problems come with this like other than uh, the fact that in DBS we do not understand the pathophysiology and why the pathophysiology in what sense there is improvement that is not understood. In this case there are also ethical concerns and other concerns that come with uh, this in general whenever you say stem cell therapy there is uh, some concern that happens it is still an open and hard area of research. Then the question is uh, what is our future hope? So that means there is no hope. So L-DOPA is going to work only for some time and uh, DBS is a controversial approach. We do not know why or how it works and stem cell therapy is again a controversial approach. What is our hope? Well, physical activity or exercise has been hypothesized to have a neuroprotective effect very important to underline that essentially neither L-DOPA nor DBS nor uh, stem cell therapy have a neuroprotective effect. It does not save the dying neurons right. It is believed that physical activity or exercise can have a neuroprotective effect. The question is in what sense is this a hypothesis uh, because a hypothesis is a uh, is a particular statement that can be disproved. How can you even disprove this? In that sense, it is very difficult to even consider this to be a hypothesis. Consider that uh, the pathology is progressing at different rates in different patients. So, essentially it is not like I can take two groups of people and uh, ask one of them to exercise and leave the other without exercising. right? If you know that both of these people have, both of these groups have Parkinson's disease, why would you not ask the other group to exercise or why would you ask the other group to not exercise, right? That is controversial. It is not just that, you can also identify groups of individuals who are predisposed to developing the pathology. Suppose I know this particular person is highly likely to develop Parkinson's disease let us say based on family history, let us let us say based on genetics, let us say based on a whole bunch of analysis I am able to predict for example that this person is highly likely to develop Parkinson's disease. Well then again you do not know if the person will surely develop Parkinson's disease then your advice is okay go and exercise and the chance that you will develop Parkinson's disease is going to reduce. Uh, let us say that the person does not get Parkinson's disease. Is it because the person did not develop other symptoms, other uh, re situations that actually lead to the pathology or is it because of exercise? In that sense you actually cannot control that experiment, that is the problem. 
So, in what sense early detection of uh, Parkinson's disease? Let us say that we are having a device, a magical device that is going to help you uh, detect the onset of Parkinson's disease much before the patient actually presents, right. I, I earlier said that uh, about 80 percent of the pathway is already compromised, right. By the time the patient presents to the clinic, 80 percent of the uh, dopaminergic pathway has been compromised. Suppose I could detect this early somehow, right. What can you do? It is not like you know you can start levodopa early because levodopa shelf life is limited, it is going to work only for so many years after that it is not going to work. Should you start levodopa on these people earlier? Lot of confusions, right. So, will early detection of Parkinson's disease um, is it going to help to postpone the debilitating symptoms by some more years if the person starts exercising? Right. Is it going to help or is it that uh, this person is having a slow progress anyway? Let us remember different patients have different rates of progress, right. not every patient is the same. So, because of this reason you do not know to what extent a particular patient is getting helped by the pathology. Right. So, should people at high risk for Parkinson's disease be screened and should they be asked to start exercising? Well, everybody should start exercising, but is this going to actually work? Again we do not know. What are the likely benefits if at all? If at all there is going to be some benefit, what are those benefits? Again that is not clear. So, essentially uh, exercise and stem cell therapy and a, a deeper understanding of DBS offer some hope in therapeutic approaches towards treating Parkinson's disease, right. What we have seen in today's class is uh, the therapeutic approaches towards treating Parkinson's disease. One is uh, levodopa or L-dopa which is a pharmacological approach and uh, the other is a surgical approach uh, deep brain stimulation is a controversial approach. And the other is the stem cell therapy again a controversial approach, approach lot more uh, research is needed before it can actually be used and uh, the other is of course, exercise, but exercise can help everybody not just people with Parkinson's disease it can help everybody. Uh, is it going to help people with uh, high likelihood of development of Parkinson's disease to postpone the possible onset of symptoms? We do not know the answer to that question. So, I am offering more questions than answers at the end of this lecture. So, with this we come to the end of this lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.